Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rula Deeb. I'm a senior principal at Geosyntec Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of this webinar series on behalf of CERDUP and ESCCP. Today's event focuses on DOD-funded research to differentiate between PFAS sources in environmental media. First, Dr. David Sedlak from the University of California, Berkeley, We'll discuss approaches for increasing confidence in results from the total oxidizable precursor assay or the top assay. David will also talk about expanding the use of the top assay to provide information for PFAS source forensics. His presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session and then we will transition to Dr. Chris Higgins from the Colorado School of Mines. Chris will talk about the development of a targeted liquid chromatography with tandem mass spectrometry method to differentiate between AFFF and non-AFFF sources, as well as the creation of a database uh, of PFAS compound abundance in discrete PFAS sources. Chris's talk will also be followed by a Q&A session, and we will conclude the webinar, if time allows it, with a longer Q&A session featuring both of today's speakers. The next several slides uh, provide instructions on optimizing your webinar experience. If you have not done so already, please download Zoom at the link shown here and provide it to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. If you cannot download Zoom, you can view the slides using a compatible internet browser, such as Firefox, IE, or Edge, and by creating a free Zoom account. If you're unable to, to view the slides or if your screen freezes, try keying in control and F5 to perform a hard refresh. If you're accessing the audio through the computer, click the arrow next to the join audio button, select the speaker and microphone and follow the prompts as they appear in, uh, on your screen. And if you continue to have any technical difficulties, just call into the conference line shown here. You can submit a comment uh, regarding your um, technical difficulty using the chat box, the chat box, but please use the chat box just to report technical difficulties or, or if you're having administrative type questions. Uh, you should not submit your questions uh, to the speakers in the chat box. You should use the Q&A option. In case of continued difficulties, just download a PDF of the slides from the webinar webpage and call into the conference line provided to you in your webinar registration confirmation email. We've also added the link to the PDF of the slides in the chat box. A note that we will be live streaming the webinar on the CERDUP and ESCCP YouTube channel at the link shown here. So that's another option for viewing today's proceedings. The broadcast today will be listen only. You can submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. Do not wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. We do encourage you to type them in well in advance um, of the Q&A sessions. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrea Leeson, who is the Deputy Director of CERDUP and ESCCP, as well as the Program Manager for the Environmental Restoration Program area. Dr. Leeson has been with CERDUP and ESCCP since 2001. And before that, she served as a research leader at the Battelle Memorial Institute, where she conducted scientific research on in-situ bioremediation and the design and implementation of innovative biological, chemical, and physical treatment technologies for site remediation and industrial wastewater. Andrea received her doctoral degree in environmental engineering from the John Hopkins University. Andrea, please proceed. Thank you, Rula, and thank you to everyone for joining us here today for this webinar. Uh, I would like to give you just a brief introduction before we go into our speak. Uh, hearing our speakers, because I'm sure you're anxious to hear the speakers and not my introduction. So let me talk just a little bit about who we are, for those of you who may not be familiar with us. Uh, our research that we're seeing today is funded by the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, or CERDIP, 
And we have a companion program called ESTCP, the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. We work, these two programs work closely together, but under CERTIP is really the science and technology or more of a traditional R&D program, which is a partnership between the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency. Whereas ESTCP is a demonstration validation program. And in there, we are taking the research or the knowledge that's come out of CERTIP or other research programs, and we are applying it to the field and testing and validating it at a larger scale in more realistic conditions so that we can get that technology ready to be implemented at a commercial scale or you know, a broader adoption throughout um, by end users. We have a number of drivers that, that really guide the sort of research we do. First is the sustainment of our testing and training ranges as well as facility and operations. And as you can imagine, this is a very broad topic. Everything from unexploded ordnance, changing environments, maritime sustainability, threatened and endangered species, it covers a lot of ground. We also look at reduction of current and future liability. That would include what we see as more a traditional pollution prevention program, which is looking at the elimination or minimization of um, pollutants, hazardous materials or processes on our installations. And then we have um, dealing with contamination from past practices. Um, this could be groundwater, soils, and sediments that have been impacted by chemicals of concern. It also includes our UXO liability. And then we also have our whole issue of the emerging chemicals of concern as well under here. So we have a number of different focus areas. They're shown here, but what I'll focus on a bit is the PFAS and AFFF area that we've been working on because that is the topic of today's presentations. And I'd like to show you this graph uh, really just for your own information. And I have put a link to it in the chat room so that if you'd like to go here and get more information about everything we're funding on PFAS, and AFFF under our programs, you can get it here. Uh, this is an interactive graph and what it shows is on the top half above the timeline, it shows sort of research areas and each of those boxes, uh, if you click it, it'll take you to another page that will show you um, the number of projects that were selected under that research area. And what it also does is gives another link that will take you to a project webpage. Once a project is concluded there, Everything that has come out of the project is listed there, um, you know, final reports, other kind of technology transition products. And then if it's continuing, you at least get, if it hasn't completed yet, you at least get a little summary of the project. The bottom half represents ESTCP projects, mostly as projects, although as we get further along the timeline, it will also represent groups of projects. So you can go here and get more information. Today, we're going to talk about uh, one particular group. And that is, whoops, sorry. That is focused on the forensics. I'm just highlighting here the research area there. Um, and so if you wanna see some other projects that are ongoing under this area, you can go to this link. I just wanted to also mention our whole technology transition area. It's ex extremely important to us and we have a number of different ways that we transition our technologies from in-person videos, uh, in-person training, guidances, manuals, et cetera. And then um, particularly these webinar series are of particular value to us. I've also put in the chat room a link to a YouTube playlist that has in, um, pulled together all of our webinars on PFAS and AFFF into one place. So if you want to Take a weekend and listen to all of those webinars. You can easily get to them there. So we have a number of webinars coming up. We try to do about two a month. Um, topics are listed here, but you can also go to this link and here you can register for upcoming webinars, but you can also go back and see the past webinars. You can get the archived versions and listen to them there. So it's at this time, I would like to turn it back to Rula to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Sedlak. 
who is the Plato Malazamov Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley. David also serves as the co-director of the Berkeley Water Center and as the deputy director of the National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center for reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure, um, otherwise known as Renew It. Uh, David is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the recipient of numerous awards, including the Paul Bush Award for Innovation in Applied Water Quality Research and the Clark Prize for Excellence in Water Research. David is also the author of a fantastic book titled Water 4.0, The Past, Present, and Future of the World's Most uh, Vital Resource. He received his bachelor's degree in environmental science from Cornell and his doctoral degree in water chemistry from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. David, all yours. Oops, uh, sorry about that. So thank you, Rula and Andrea, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here talking to everyone in the CERTIP world this morning, uh, today. When I started working with these chemicals over 10 years ago, I didn't know that we could ever get this many people showing up to hear about research on them, but a lot has happened in the last decade. They've, they've taken on a very prominent role. And one of the things that I think is really quite interesting is the way in which one of our early projects uh, with CERDEP, that was the, uh, the creation, that led to the creation of the top assay, has been picked up and used by uh, researchers and practitioners around the world. And that's really what I'd like to talk with you uh, about today. So here's an overview of my talk for today. I'm going to start by uh, talking about the project. It's ER 201330, one of the groups of projects that Andrea showed you in that slide a few moments ago. Um, this project is uh, intended to take the total oxidizable precursor and make it into a forensics assay or a forensic approach. And so I'll tell you a little about some of the way in which the top assay works. I'll tell you some of the limitations of the top assay. When we originally designed it, we were intending for it to be used with contaminated soil and groundwater. And since that point, a lot of people have employed it for different applications, some of them successful and some of them have uh, run into these limitations in the method. I'll tell you something about how we hope to improve the method by uh, looking a little more rigorously at the QA, QC, and the way in which the technology works. But I'll also tell you uh, something about how we're intending to expand the method to pick up the ultra short PFAS compounds and the uh, branched and linear compounds. Uh, we'll talk a little about how the top assay could be used for PFAS forensics, and, and some researchers have already started to do that but I'll also show you the way in which some newer analytical techniques, uh, multivariate analysis techniques can be used with TOP. And I'll tell you about some next steps. And in particular, I'll make a plea for people in the audience to work with us to provide some, some data so that we can improve the quality of this technique as a forensics tool. And then we'll talk a little about some of the benefits to the Department of Defense. So our project objective could be you know, characterized by God, or maybe from our title. Remember, the title was a simple and robust uh, method for PFAS forensics. I'll tell you a little about how the top assay is simple, and I'll tell you about how it's robust, and then I'll tell you something uh, about how we intend to apply it for forensics. We're only just now completing the first year of the project, so much of our effort to date has gone into the aforementioned QA, QC improvements, as well as expanding the method to some new techniques. So uh, we hope to uh, expand the method to allow us to selectively oxidize different types of polyfluorinated compounds so we can discriminate between different uh, precursors. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. And then uh, I'll tell you a little about how it will be used for forensics. But most of this talk today will really be uh, uh, focused on the method itself. And uh, the two bullet points here will be the subject of the second and third years of the project. 
So the top assay is a simple method. When we developed it in uh, in about 2014, and you'll see there's there's a method paper at the end of this presentation, which you can look at for uh, the original work. We found that if you exposed polyfluoroalkyl substances to hydroxyl radical, you could convert them into their corresponding perfluorocarboxylic acids. So for example, for the ECF precursors, that is this family of precursors that are common in a lot of AFFF, uh, the reaction with hydroxyl radical would just simply uh, cut off the, uh, the, the salt at the, between the, the carbon and the sulfur group and give us the corresponding carboxylate. Whereas if we used hydroxyl radical to oxidize the fluorotelomers, we got the perfluorocarboxylic acids, but we got a, a suite of them with different chain lengths. So we had this sequential unzipping, if you will, of the uh, poly, uh, the perfluoroalkyl part of the molecule. And so we got a, a suite of different compounds. And that alone can tell you something about whether you have a source that's rich in ECF precursors or fluorotelomer precursors. But it's a relatively simple method. The top assay, since the time that we published that first work has also become a widely available method. These are screenshots that I took from uh, three different commercial labs that offer the total oxidizable precursor along with their other analytical services. And uh, when we developed that method, we did it because really the way in which we oxidize the compounds is something that any uh, commercial or research lab could easily do. You basically took a water sample, you raise the pH, you put in uh, a, a persulfate salt, pot potassium persulfate, you heated the sample in a water bath, and then you cooled it and reanalyzed it. And the increase in concentrations of perfluorocarboxylates uh, in, that occurred during that heating process when the hydroxyl radical was produced uh, tell you the concentration of uh, compounds. So you don't need uh, analytical standards for some of the more obscure PFAS compounds, you measure the easily measured perfluorocarboxylates and they give you a, a, an estimate of the concentration of precursors that were present. So the real question is, is the top assay a robust method? And when we were doing our original research, we had a relatively uh, simple set of water samples that we hope to look at. We were focused on contaminated groundwater, contaminated aquifer sediments, and the source materials themselves, the AFFF, which we could simply dilute to a point where we could analyze it by the top assay. But lots of people over time have tried to apply it to things as diverse as uh, uh, sewage sludge and landfill leachate and biological tissues. And, uh, and sometimes the method uh, might fail because the oxidants, the hydroxyl radical, uh, or the persulfate are consumed by the matrix itself and you don't generate a sufficient amount of hydroxyl radical. The other possible limitation of the method is that there may be some transformation products that cannot be measured. So for example, things like Gen X or compounds where the, uh, the perfluor part of the uh, molecule has an ether group in it or some other functional group may not get converted to the carboxylates. And then finally, uh, talking to laboratories about the method, we saw that there were times when uh, things beyond the organic hydroxyl radical scavengers in the matrix might be a concern. For example, if you have a sample that's very acidic, you might not be able to raise the pH up to a level where the uh, persulfate is converted to hydroxyl radical, or in samples that contain uh, metals like uh, iron, you might form a precipitate that would take the perfluorocarboxylates out of solution. So for the past year, we've been trying to improve the method and uh, answer some of these questions about robustness. Uh, the first thing that we did was we added an oxidation surrogate to the top assay. So we're able to purchase a C13 labeled form of FOSA, one of the ECF precursors, and what is nice about that is we can add that to every sample, subject it to the top assay, and then we convert it to the corresponding uh, perfluorocarboxylic acid where all the carbons are C13 labeled. And that allows us to discriminate it from the, uh, the FOSA that might be present in the sample itself, because the sample itself 
uh, most of the carbons would be uh, would not be uh, C13, they'd be C12. And so here's some results from some groundwater samples where we use the oxidation surrogate and you see we get nearly 100% yield or 100% conversion. So when we add this, we can be certain that we have generated enough oxidizing radicals during the uh, hydroxyl radical production process. The uh, other thing that was a concern is that there might be organics in the sample that serve as hydroxyl radical scavengers. And so we, by understanding how the method works, that is that you're generating hydroxyl radicals. And if you have something like, uh, in this case, butyl carbitol, the, uh, the alcohol that's present in AFFF, it might scavenger hydroxyl radicals and prevent the conversion of the, uh, of the precursors into the carboxylate. So here's a simple experiment where we took the uh, M8 FOSA oxidation surrogate and we added increasing amounts of DGBE to the sample. And when we got above 150 milligrams of carbon per liter, um, we saw that we, we didn't convert it. We, we, the, the M8 FOSA stayed in its original form and wasn't converted to the PFOA during the top assay. So what this means is that uh, in samples with really high TOC concentrations or really high concentrations of organic compounds, you might not get conversion. But again, if you have the fully labeled FOSA compound present, you can tell whether or not that happened. But really the take home point is that um, the top assay is pretty robust till you get to very high concentrations of organic carbon, kind of like the levels that you would find perhaps in landfill leachate or uh, organic rich waste. But again, you can always take a sample and dilute it to a level where the carbon comes uh, to concentrations that don't scavenge all of the radicals. Um, another issue was the oxidation yield. Um, I showed you in that earlier slide that the ECF precursors are transformed primarily to only one compound. And uh, we saw relatively high yields for things like, like FOSA. And this slide just shows you a comparison of our results to some papers that have been published over the last few years on these yields. And uh, the, the blue compounds on, on the right are the ECF compounds where we see yields close to 100%. Uh, the fluorotelomers, which are mainly on the left, you can see that the yields range from about 25 to uh, close to 100%. The lower yields on the fluorotelomers are for the shorter chain compounds. And that's because some of the shorter chain compounds are broken into uh, shorter chains again by that unzipping process that I talked about. And we're producing the uh, C2 and C3 carboxylates, which are not measured by the standard top assay. We've started to measure those so-called ultra short compounds now. And we see that they are indeed explaining some of the, uh, the relatively low yields. But even for something like the 4,2-fluorotelomer sulfonates, uh, uh, you can see that uh, we don't quite get 100% because some of them are actually uh, fully mineralized. And then uh, the, the last kind of uh, uh, artifacts or issues that we're concerned about are the presence of inorganic substances that might affect the performance of the top assay. Uh, one of those that was a concern uh, expressed to us by some of the commercial labs that have been running the top assay was the presence of iron. And what you can see in the little inset photo here is what happens if you have a groundwater sample that has very high concentrations of iron in it. During the top assay, any ferrous iron in the sample gets oxidized to ferric iron and then it precipitates. And the concern is that some of the perfluorocarboxylates exhibit an affinity for iron oxides and can be uh, swept out of solution by that precipitating iron. So we've done some experiments have found that you can go up to pretty high iron concentrations before this really becomes an issue in the top assay. Uh, but again, I would, I would consider some caution when you have very high concentrations of iron above uh, you know, uh, 50 or, or so milligrams per liter. And then the other concern would be if you had a sample that was acidic, because the first step in the top assay requires that we raise the pH up to above 13 with sodium hydroxide, and we use a fixed amount of sodium hydroxide. So if you had a very acidic sample, uh, you might not fully neutralize it. 
So we find that we can go up to uh, down to pHs of four or three, uh, 3.5 without an issue. But when you get down below around pH three, you might have to add additional sodium hydroxide to reach those very low pH, uh, high pHs. And that additional salt could be a concern. So we recommend that people um, dilute samples if they're extremely acidic like this. Um, I wanted to turn my attention a little bit to the forensic applications. Again, we're only in the first year of this project. So in the second and third year, we're really going to jump into the, uh, the forensics techniques with uh, uh, a little bit more effort. Um, I told you so far about the simple and robust method that the, the top assay is, and that's, that means that it's very easy to collect data on precursors. And so there are uh, many, many sites now where people are analog collecting these data, which means that it could be very valuable for fingerprinting because there's a rich data set to train any statistical models that we might build. Um, and then what's nice about it is that it's not just qualitative, it's quantitative information that can be used to make calculations of the relative contributions from different sources. So when we think about fingerprinting with the top assay, we had some initial expectations when we went into this. First of all, uh, the precursor mix or the fingerprint that we get from applying the top assay will be specific to the source material that we're dealing with. Uh, also, the chain length uh, of the perfluorocarboxylates that are produced are going to be indicative of the use period. That is, the older AFFF is going to tend to have longer chain length perfluorocarboxylates produced uh, because that's what was used before the C8 formulations were phased out. And then also uh, the branched and linear ratios might give us some clues about the manufacturing process. For example, uh, ECF versus fluorotelomers will have characteristic patterns of branched and linear precursors. We haven't really gotten too deeply into that, but we're starting to see that in some of the work we do in our lab that I, I won't talk about today. The point is that there's a lot of information hidden within the top data. And if you can mine that information, it could be very useful for forensics. Let me give you an example here of how we can use uh, existing uh, uh, data. So this is a, a plot showing you uh, something called uniform manifold approximation and projection or UMAP. It's a technique that's somewhat similar to the more familiar technique of principal component analysis. And what I've done here is I've uh, plotted uh, the signals of the perfluorocarboxylates and sulfonates from uh, just the straight analysis without the top assay. And you can see that in general, the data cluster. So you can see the data from uh, wastewater effluent is separated a little bit from the influent. You can see that uh, stormwater plots in a little bit of a different place than, uh, than, than uh, say, the, the wastewater or, uh, or the airport samples here. But I want to draw your attention to this little green dot, which there's an arrow pointing to. This was a sample that we analyzed uh, working with the state of California from what they characterized as a mixed source, that is, it was a site where they weren't sure what the source of contamination was. And just using the uh, PFAS data, it would be hard to discriminate the, the source from the different fingerprints because they kind of overlap. If we take those same data and plot them with the top assay, you can see that that green sample scatters with the airport samples. It doesn't look anything like the wastewater or the stormwater samples, or for that matter, uh, the specific samples that we had from um, the San Francisco airport wastewater treatment plant. And so you could see that it really tightens up. If, if you compare these two plots here, you can see without the top assay and with the top assay, it really tightens up the fingerprinting uh, with the top assay. And so with that in mind, uh, we're trying to expand the data set. Uh, this is uh, top assay data that might be collected by a commercial lab or by a researcher. We're not even talking about the improvements that, that we've made that I've talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, we'd love to have your data. So among the people on this call, if you have access to a data set where the precursors have been measured by the top assay, 
we'd love to use it to continue to train our UMAP data set. And we're happy to work with you. We don't have to uh, identify the specific source. Really, the main thing we need to know is uh, what the expected source of contamination is. Or if you have a site and you don't know the source of contamination, we could run it through our model and tell you what the, our results suggest that it might be. We'd like to uh, turn this into a predictive tool that can be shared broadly with the community and could be uh, accessible to lots of uh, folks in the research and practitioner community. And we'd like to continuously improve it over the lifetime of our project. So our next steps is uh, we're feverishly working on a QA QC guidance for the top assay, uh, the kinds of things that I talked about earlier in the presentations to make sure that we don't accidentally analyze samples in an inappropriate way, which might lead to artifacts and also to, uh, so that the commercial and uh, research labs could implement this uh, oxidation uh, surrogate, the M8 BOSA. Uh, we're going to then turn our attention to expanding the predictive capabilities um, and that means uh, growing our data set with more source materials, like for example, samples from landfills and plating operations, but also samples that you might share with us. Um, we're starting to measure the ultra shorts uh, the, and the branched and linear ratios, and we're finding that it gives us some very interesting information. This is not something that the commercial labs have been collecting, but we hope to um, standardize it and use it for some forensics applications and then also to see if we could add into our model uh, data on other attributes of samples that might improve the fingerprinting predictive capabilities. Finally, in the last part of the project, we'd like to look uh, at the effect of transport and transformation on those fingerprints, because we expect that some of the precursors will uh, stay behind in the source zone and some will migrate downstream and we might be able to learn something about the extent of transformation or the nature of it based upon the changes in the fingerprints. So in conclusion, uh, I showed you today that the top essay really is simple. I've shown you that it's robust and I think it's pretty evident that it's broadly available. Lots of people are using it now to quantify uh, PFAS compounds or precursors as we call them that people don't routinely analyze. Um, our project in the initial phase is improving the confidence that people have in the method and extending its uh, applications uh, to the ultra shorts and linear and branch compounds. I showed you just a taste of how it can provide data that are quite useful for forensics. And I made a plea to you to help us improve its utility by sharing data. Uh, in terms of benefits for the Department of Defense, I think it, it's pretty clear that it, it's a very practical way uh, for uh, understanding something about the precursors in the sample or the sources in the sample without resorting to the kind of research grade technologies that Professor Higgins will tell you about uh, in the second part of the webinar today. And also our project is hoping to standardize the top assay to increase people's uh, confidence and in, improve its performance. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Professor Lisa Alvarez-Cohen, my co-PI on the project, Dr. Chris Olivares, who was a postdoc, but now is an assistant professor at UC Irvine, and the Berkeley student team, Ned Yanghua and Katerina. And uh, I'll leave you uh, with some uh, additional resources, which you can find uh, these papers, or if you can get access to them, just send me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a reprint. Uh, to, so you can learn more about the previous research. And finally, uh, a link to our project uh, webpage and more importantly, my email. So again, if you have those samples and would like to talk to us about getting involved in the research, please uh, feel free to shoot me an email. And uh, that's it. Thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much, David, for a very clear and excellent presentation. Just a reminder for our audience, you may submit questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. Please do not use the chat function. Uh, we've only received 24 questions for you, David. So let's start with a first one from the um, Illinois EPA. Uh, you mentioned that low pH can affect the outcome of the top assay testing. 
What are the effects, if any, of the opposite, where you have a site with extremely high pH values in soil or groundwater? I don't expect high pH to have a big impact on the top assays because the key is getting the pH above 13. So the sulfate radical that's produced when persulfate decomposes is converted to hydroxyl radical. So perhaps the, the only impact that I could imagine is um, if you get to really, really high pHs, you might have something uh, uh, precipitate out of the solution or um, or otherwise cause an artifact. Um, if, if that was necessary, a lab could simply cut back on the amount of sodium hydroxide. The important part is that you uh, exceed the, the minimum threshold pH. I believe that's something like 13, so that you're producing exclusively hydroxyl radical and not sulfate radical. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, you showed that the top assay is very robust when applied to groundwater, um, wastewater, um, and sources like fire training areas. Where and when else will it work? And where and when is it likely to fail? Let me start with this, this issue of where it, it, I would be most concerned about it failing. Um, a few years ago, I, I visited Australia and I was talking to folks there in, in Canberra uh, working with the government uh, on, on top assay, and they told me about how some projects are mandating the use of the top assay for fish tissues. And I was, I was surprised by that because I would think that fish tissues with all of the lipids and proteins in them would uh, have too much organic scavenger. And those organic scavengers might prevent the hydroxyl radical from converting the precursors to the carboxylate. So I would be very concerned about samples that have very high levels of organics, uh, samples to which solvents have been added. So for example, when we uh, extract uh, precursors from soils, we typically do it by extracting them with methanol, but then we wash, we dry the methanol off before we do the top assay. So certainly anytime you have high levels of organics present, uh, I would be very cautious. And again, like I said today, sometimes you can figure out if you have uh, an artifact by diluting a sample by a factor of 10 or a factor of 100, because we're often able to detect the perfluorocarboxylates down to extremely low concentrations. And so we're, we can still do our analysis in a diluted sample but that dilution might dilute the, the radical scavengers that lead to the artifact. The other place I'd be a little bit careful is uh, recognizing that there are some PFAS compounds that don't get converted to carboxylates. For example, Gen X or uh, some of the PFAS compounds with uh, uh, ether groups or oxygens in the middle of the perfluorocarboxylate chain. And you know, we're, we've been doing some work in this project on compounds like that, and some other researchers have been doing them. Recognize that it's the linear chain uh, PFAS compounds that are converted with a high efficiency. Some of those other uh, more obscure compounds might not be converted to perfluorocarboxylate. So you could have organic fluorine containing compounds or PFAS compounds in a water sample that don't get converted to uh, PFCAs. Great, thank you, David. We've gotten about four questions on slides 31 and 32, which have to do with the airport data that you showed. What is the source of the airport's water? Is it groundwater and or surface water collected in the vicinity of airports? Uh, okay, um, those airport samples, if, if you look at the end of the presentation, there are a couple of uh, papers in there. Those data come from the work that Erica Hoots did after uh, when she was was working for uh, uh, the state after she finished her her uh, PhD with us, and those were airports around the San Francisco Bay Area, and I believe that most of those were groundwater samples. Great, thank you, David. Um, we got several questions about the reproducibility um, of the top assay. Um, can you speak to that, please? Uh, when we run the top assay, we, uh, we, we have the QA, QC that you might expect for it. So we, uh, 
we when we when we do samples in triplicate, we get pretty tight reproducibility. Uh, moreover, we've been doing some intercomparisons uh, uh, of our data with others, and and find that um, you know, for example, I showed you the yields of the precursors. They they agree pretty closely. So at least our experience working with these samples is uh, is that uh, we have pretty good uh, precision in the analysis, and and we've we've done spike recoveries and things like that, and we have uh, pretty good accuracy. So I, I think that the precision and accuracy, accuracy aspects of the top assay, we're seeing the errors on the same order of magnitude as the errors we see uh, for our measurements of PFAS. Um, I do want to caution people, especially researchers who are just starting to use the top assay, like most new techniques, uh, you need to practice it a little bit and, and you need to, to, to work at it. So when we take a new analyst into the group working on the top assay, usually um, it's a few months before they're able to to, to run the uh, techniques with uh, high high reproducibility. And I think that's similar for uh, commercial and research labs when they implement any new technique. It takes a little practice. Thank you, David. And this is a question from the USGS. How low can you go with the top assay? Uh, nanogram per liter, microgram per liter? What, what sort of concentrations can you get to? So ultimately the limitation on the top assay is coming from the fact that you're subtracting one number from another number. So if your sample has high concentrations of PFCAs in it to begin with, what you're looking for is the delta, the increase in PFCA concentrations that occur upon oxidation. So, so if you have a sample with lots of PFCAs and only a little bit of precursors, it's the uncertainty in subtracting those two large numbers. If you had a sample that didn't have very much PFCA in it or had no PFCAs in it, then our sensitivity is about as good as the sensitivity of measuring the PFCAs themselves. So that's a nanogram per liter level. So in clean, cleaner groundwater samples, we're, we're detecting uh, precursors at concentrations of uh, several nanograms per liter each. So, you know, again, it's for a different chain length. So for each chain length, we might uh, have a detection limit of, uh, of, of one or two nanograms per liter. Great, thank you, David. Um, a specific question from EPA Region 10. Can AFFF sources be differentiated specifically from electrochemical metal plating sources using the top assay? Have you tried to apply uh, it in this manner? Thanks. I think that, that that's one of the things we're trying to do in our, our study. So we've, uh, we've partnered with the, the state board here in California, and they've been doing a large survey of uh, sites around the state where they're detecting PFAS in drinking water sources, and they're also collecting samples near some of the uh, putative sources. So between that and the fingerprints that we hope to obtain, we, we hope to be able to answer that question in the next year or two, um, because I, I think it's 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 an important uh, deliverable for any kind of forensics technique that it can do that kind of differentiation. So we're we're hopeful, but we don't know the answer yet. Thank you, David. And we've got a lot of questions about the cost, not in your lab, but in commercial labs that you alluded to. Do you have a typical range for the cost of uh, per sample to, to conduct the top assay analysis? Um, I have not been out pricing these uh, these analyses, and and I wouldn't want to uh, to divulge that uh, if I did know. But I, I can say that. In terms of the effort involved, uh, relative to actually uh, analyzing a sample for PFAS, it's it's about the same amount. So, for example, if you have a sample and you want to analyze for the top assay, you are probably already intending to measure for the PFAS compounds. So, it's basically taking a second sample, doing this treatment, adding the persulfate and heating it, and then analyzing it again. That should, in my opinion, be you know be about double just analyzing the sample itself. So that's my guess. If you're already paying a commercial lab to analyze samples for PFAS, probably double it, and you'd have both the PFAS and the top assay. 
Great. Thank you so much. Um, this is a question from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Do you expect any difficulties in, in testing spent yak using the top assay? Oh, gee, I, I don't know. We haven't uh, tried to do spent GAC yet, but I, I guess the problem is you either need to get the compounds off the carbon or you have to try to analyze them in place. And, and what I've seen about trying to use dissolved radicals to treat activated carbon is that that's, that's a very difficult thing to do. So I would think you'd have to uh, find a way to elute them off the GAC and, and, uh, and then subject them to the, the top assay, which would mean that they'd be in solvent. So you'd probably extract them in some kind of solvent, then you'd have to evaporate off the solvent and then resuspend them in water and do the top assay. I think that's doable, but we, we haven't uh, tried doing that yet. It, it, it's kind of uh, an interesting task and, and maybe something that we could turn our attention to in the future. Great, thank you so much, David. We're not gonna get to, to all the questions, but depending on time towards the end, we'll try and answer as many as we can. Uh, David's information, um, email address and project website link are included in the in the PDF of the slides. So we'd encourage you to reach out to him directly. And David, you've got several offers from folks that have volunteered to share their data. So we'll make sure that you get that. But Hooray. at this point, we're gonna, <laughs> <laughs> yes, awesome. Uh, tech transfer, yay. All right, um, our next speaker today is uh, Dr. Chris Higgins, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, Chris's research focuses on the fate and transport of contaminants in the environment with a focus on PFAS. He has co-authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications and has received the 2019 Hoover Prize by the American Society of Civil Engineers for his research contributions. Chris earned his bachelor's degree in chemistry and chemical biology from Harvard and his master's and doctoral degrees in civil and environmental engineering from Stanford University. Chris, please proceed. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rula. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and uh, I thank you for the invitation to present. And I'm, I'm very happy to be following David because I think actually he, he very much laid out what I think is an important tool uh, in uh, the, the developing forensic uh, environmental PFAS forensic source um, allocation toolbox. Uh, and so what I'm going to present is some work that we're doing uh, started about the same time uh, as David's project, where we're, we're taking a slightly different approach to try and get at these uh, PFAS forensics questions. All right, so my agenda today, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges of doing uh, PFAS forensics, go through the project objectives, I'm really getting into uh, source characterization, uh, what are those um, original sources where these uh, PFASs might have been released uh, into the environment. Talk briefly about transformation pathways for the polyfluorinated compounds, and I'll explain why that's more important uh, in a moment. Uh, but then the ultimate goal of this project is to try and develop a, a forensic panel, uh, essentially an LCMS, uh, a standard triple quadrupole uh, LCMS panel for PFAS environmental source allocation. Um, however, we recognize that that may not always give you uh, the answer that you need. There may be some ambiguity associated with some of those results. And so one of the, the secondary objectives is to try and understand how we can quantif um, confidently identify uh, some compounds that are present in um, environmental samples using high resolution mass spectrometry. Uh, and that requires having something like a mass spectral PFAS library. So I'll talk about how that fits in uh, in, in a few slides. Obviously, I'll try and wrap up uh, what we found so far for this project and then benefits to DOD as well. So what the, the question we're really trying to get at uh, in terms of doing PFAS forensics is where did this uh, contamination come from? Where in the environment did this contamination come from? Uh, and so that's what we're, we're, why we're all here today. Uh, and uh, I will note that it can sometimes be difficult to identify uh, a source from an environmental sample. You really need to have some information about where the sample was collected uh, and, and, and that sort of information coupled with some chemical data can help us, I think, identify uh, the sources. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to keep in mind 
is that um, both David's talk as well as my talk will, will highlight why uh, polyfluorinated compounds, uh, these polyfluorinated substances, may actually aid in environmental source allocation. And in David's uh, presentation, uh, the top assay is a fantastic indirect way of measuring the presence of these polyfluorinated substances. What I'm going to be focusing on today is a more of a direct approach to understand the presence of uh, polyfluorinated substances. So it's, it's very complementary uh, to the top assay uh, approach that the David's team is taking. And what this is really kind of getting at is that when you have a release of these compounds to the environment, both poly and perfluoroalkyl substances, uh, they're often co-occurring uh, from different environmental sources. Uh, those compounds can uh, essentially transform and be differentially transported as, they, as you move down gradient, such that uh, if you're far enough away from a source or it, enough time has elapsed or a site has been significantly remediated, you may end up with just per terminal perfluoroalkyl acids, the carboxylates uh, and the sulfonates uh, that, that David was, uh, was talking about with the top assay. So in effect, uh, David was kind of focusing his efforts on understanding you know, what happens if you force where you are in this funnel down towards these perfluorinated, um, these perfluoroalkyl acids. What we're trying to do in our project is recognize if you're a little bit further up that funnel, can that help you identify uh, the actual source uh, of where these compounds were released. So one of our objectives uh, is to characterize these different environmental sources. So the different um, original places where, or types of places where these chemicals might've been uh, released. There is a major focus uh, per the request for uh, proposals from DOD on differentiating uh, HBLF versus non-HBLF uh, sites. Uh, but the, the, the overall goal here is to understand and characterize uh, these, these different types of environmental sources. One of the reasons why the transformation pathways are important is if we are going to try and uh, eventually develop a forensic uh, PFAS testing panel, uh, which I'll, I'll also talk about, we want to understand if there are polyfluorinated compounds that deter we determine are particularly differentiating. So in other words, the presence of a, a, partic uh, of a particular precursor is indicative of a one particular type of uh, source we want to make sure that that compound is, is stable enough such that um, it's not going to be rapidly transformed uh, and lose that differentiating power. So, that we, so we need to understand where those compounds fall within the broader context of, of precursor transformation. Again, our, our ultimate goal is to develop this uh, forensic uh, testing panel uh, using multivariate statistics and machine learning from the data uh, collected uh, under the first objective, but also on, uh, in the context of the second. Uh, and then again, when the forensic panel does not work, uh, can we have the backup plan of this high resolution uh, mass spectral library that people can use uh, to try and uh, identify uh, some of these polyfluorinated compounds that might be present in a sample and use that to further uh, indicate a potential source uh, or environmental source of these compounds. So with respect to the uh, PFAS source characterization, this is work that is being led by Jennifer Fields Group at Oregon State, part of our, our member team. Um, this is the, these are the various end member uh, types of um, environmental sources that we have so far analyzed by high resolution mass spectrometry. Uh, and again, uh, I can talk about that later if there are questions, but this is a slightly more, um, a slightly fancier technique uh, than the traditional uh, LCMS that many folks have been uh, collecting data for at their sites. Uh, but what you can see looking at this table is that we've been looking at firefighting foams uh, that were, um, as far as we know, were manufactured back uh, to the early 70s. We've looked at uh, groundwater from uh, known HBLF impacted sites, looking at landfill leachate, uh, municipal wastewater, biosolids, amended soil leachates. And then uh, as uh, the opportunities present themselves, effluent from various other types of sources that we know may have uh, contributed PFAS out into the environment. So pulp uh, and paper uh, effluent manufacturing sites and power generation sites. And so all of these sorts of samples have been collected. Some of them had been uh, previously stored in an archive uh, and had are been analyzed by HRMS. And we're in the process of now uh, analyzing that and putting it together. One of the things that I'll just kind of share from the preliminary analysis is that using a statistical tool called hierarchical clustering analysis, which tends to uh, group uh, different types of um, samples uh, based on their similarities, we uh, can already see that it, we can probably differentiate different types of foam. Uh, 
So this is just looking at the different types of HPLF, uh, showing a very clear distinction between uh, uh, ECF foams, i.e. those that were made uh, by 3M, and the fluorotelomer foams from different manufacturers. Now there is an outlier there uh, where we, we are not entirely sure if this was foam, ECF foam that had been put into an Ansel bucket. Um, uh, that is actually commonly occurs uh, when you uh, get these samples uh, retrieved from uh, fire stations or from military sites uh, around the US. Uh, but we're, we're chasing that down to, in, to really figure out if that is a, an outlier or if, if that was some sort of mixture. But the point here is that uh, we can uh, already start to see some very clear distinctions between the different types of foams. Uh, and we're gonna be trying to carry this sort of analysis forward, not just distinguishing between the foams, but also between foam uh, and other types of uh, releases. But uh, along the lines of the um, HPLF uh, differentiating, one of the tools that we're also using is support vector classification. And the idea here is we want to identify the chemical features, the individual chemicals uh, that are most differentiating. So in other words, uh, things that are highly distinguishing uh, and say that you know, this is definitely coming from this source or is more likely than not coming from this source are things that tend to have a value closer to one. And then a, a minus one value would be basically saying it's coming from the other source. And so uh, this was really helpful to uh, figure out which chemicals are differentiating and not. Uh, and as applied here, when we're complying, when we're comparing 3M HPLF versus nat national foam HPLF, we see perhaps not surprisingly that sulfonates such as PFOS uh, are, uh, are differentiating. They basically uh, differentiate the 3M foam versus the other foams. In national foam, comparing to, to 3M, uh, we see PFNA uh, comes up and I'll, I'll touch on that in a more in a moment. Um, but then also some of these very specific polyfluorinated precursors. And so uh, that does lend credence to the idea that the polyfluorinated compounds, in addition to the perfluoroalkyl acids, can be very helpful in differentiating uh, some of these environmental sources. One of the things I thought was particularly interesting uh, that honestly came uh, a bit of a surprise was that uh, when Jennifer was able to collect uh, some of these uh, foams, she was able to collect foams that met military specification. In other words, in other words their label indicated that they were um, listed as, uh, as foams available for purchase um, by, uh, meeting military specification. But there were also foams that she was uh, able to obtain that were not military specification. So these presumably were not used by at military sites, but may have been used by uh, fence line partners or other types of uh, sites, uh, oil refineries, um, those sorts of type of lo locations that may not have been uh, uh, required to uh, use foam that met mill spec. Uh, and when she did this analysis on uh, some of these different foams, uh, it was pretty interesting that uh, one of these foams, or uh, I should say a series of these foams, showed linear, uh, so therefore non-ECF, uh, uh, carboxylates, and particularly the odd chain link carboxylates, and, and PFNA being the most abundant. And this just uh, is, is helpful because it, it indicates, you know, if you can see some of these individual compounds, uh, that may actually help differentiate not just the different foams, but also whether it was a, a military site perhaps, or a non-military site that might be contributing uh, to, uh, to the contamination. Keeping in mind that the presumption there is that the, the military site was not using non-mil spec foam. Uh, and just to throw uh, a, a little bit of a, another spin on this, one of the interesting things that uh, has also kind of come up with this analysis is in addition to looking at mass spec data, uh, Jennifer's team has also been using NMR or nuclear magnetic, magnetic resonance to uh, look at these different foams. And what we've known for some time is that the ECF-based uh, foams uh, were quite uh, complex. There's a lot of different peaks there. These are, each of those peaks corresponds to essentially different atoms containing fluorine uh, in a sample, uh, uh, or I should say different uh, carbons in a fluorine uh, containing uh, a, a carbons in a molecule that contain fluorine, sorry. Um, and it's quite complex. There's lots of different uh, uh, types of uh, fluorinated compounds in the ECF-based foams. The telomer foams tend to be much cleaner, much neater, and much simpler. And this was evident uh, not just in our mass spec data, but is also evident in the, in the, in the NMR data. And we think this is a complementary tool that may be useful in some cases for differentiating these types of foams. Now, when I talk about transformation pathway mapping before, I mentioned the, the point of this is that we want to understand if there are distinguishing compounds that are polyfluorinated, we want to understand, are they potentially stable, <coughs> excuse me, 
um, are they potentially stable enough to be useful in forensics? So in other words, where in the transformation pathway from a uh, polyfluorinated precursor to the perfluoroalkyl acids do some of these compounds uh, fall? And so we've uh, compiled a, a number of studies that out there on these polyfluorinated transformation pathways. We're working on a manuscript uh, soon to be submitted that summarizes all the information that is currently known. But we recognize that there's a lot of other compounds that still need to be studied. Uh, and, and I think there uh, will this will be an evolving area where we'll have to add more information as it becomes available. But just to give you a sense of the sort of information that we have available, this is a, a transformation pathway map for some uh, known uh, polyfluorinated compounds. Uh, and if you look, uh, I don't want you to, to worry too much about the, the detailed pathway, but just recognize that all roads eventually lead uh, to PFOS, at least uh, for the, these series of compounds that have been studied. So uh, if they all are transformed to PFOS, then you only have one chemical that you might observe. Uh, but if some of these intermediates are stable enough, we may actually be able to observe them at sites uh, and they may be indicative of some of these uh, uh, precursors also being present. And knowing that these precursors was, were associated with the different types of uses, uh, then that will help us uh, differentiate uh, these different uh, sources in the environment. So all the ultimate goal of all this is to try and develop this forensic LCMSMS panel. Uh, and so it's not just uh, the information collected uh, uh, from the transformation pathway, but also using multivariate statistics to look at all of the data we've uh, collected from the different sources using both unsupervised learning approaches, supervised learning approaches, uh, and, and try to determine what are the most robust predictors of specific uh, PFAS environmental sources. And that's the ultimate goal. We're gonna use a lot of different techniques uh, to try and get there. Uh, this is just a quick uh, uh, overview of the types of different techniques we're looking at. Um, David mentioned uh, principal component analysis as one commonly used statistical technique to differentiate sources. I, I gave an example of hierarchical clustering, but also support vector classification as tools that could be helpful uh, in identifying what are the robust predictors of one or, or, or any individual uh, PFAS environmental source. Uh, to give you an example, uh, before we had the data available uh, where uh, Jennifer, Field, uh, Jennifer Field's group had uh, generated all the data that is now undergoing this analysis, um, our statistics team uh, led by Damian Helbling from Cornell uh, went out to get uh, data that was already available. And this is an example of looking at data that was collected from, uh, from groundwater in Rhode Island. And it was for a limited number of compounds. So uh, a much smaller panel than we would normally have liked. Uh, but uh, this analysis is showing that the hierarchical clustering analysis, trying to group the different types of sites. Uh, and, and what we found from this analysis of, the, of those data uh, indicate that there are 18 different groups of sites that share specific uh, concentration patterns. And so uh, an example of this would be the data in the black box showing a group of sites that had high PFBS, but pretty low, uh, a lot of everything else. Uh, and, uh, and what we're now undergoing is trying to take that information and looking at it in a geospatial context. So understanding where these sites are, are they uh, down gradient from different uh, specific types of sources? Can we, uh, can we evaluate that in a statistical manner? Uh, and that will be uh, helpful to us as we uh, separately go through all of the data generated under our first objective. This will help us to kind of separately validate that some of these features are more indicative of different types of sources versus others. So this is very much work ongoing, but it's very promising that we see this, this type of clustering among the different types of environmental sources. And in a similar analysis, um, this is returning to our uh, support vector classification type approach. Uh, there was a great data set uh, put out by uh, Torsten Kibbe uh, about a year or so ago where they evaluated a large number of uh, 1,200 or some odd uh, sites looking at eight different chemicals. Uh, and what we did is we took that data and, and fed it into our support factor uh, classification uh, tool. And uh, what was particularly helpful is that this tool uh, correctly classified all samples with 92% correct cross-validation balanced accuracy, uh, basically getting the, getting the characteriz uh, characterization of it being a foam or a non-foam impacted site pretty darn accurate. Uh, but what we're showing here uh, on the right is what that S-curve or, uh, or a support vector classification profile looks like. 
Uh, and in this case, using at least this data set, it's uh, suggested that PFOS and PFHXS were the for the within at least this context the most uh, the most robust predictors uh, that uh, foam had been used at those particular sites. Uh, this is using the data set that's here. We're obviously very interested in using the data uh, that were, we were collected as part of our uh, our initial objective, and that is exactly what we're doing uh, right now. I mentioned that when we get this PFAS uh, forensic panel, LCMS uh, panel ready, um, it may not always uh, serve the purpose that it needs to. In other words, there may be some ambiguous data or ambiguous results as we look at uh, what's out there. So there is this other technique known as high resolution mass spectrometry, uh, which is uh, being employed by many academic labs that allows us to look for many, many more compounds than a typical uh, LCMS analysis uh, uh, does. And what we are doing is, is trying to make that analysis of HRMS data a little bit more robust. And some of the major barriers to using HRMS for PFAS identification are the lack of reference standards. Uh, and when you're dealing with uh, HRMS data, you need to pay attention to the fact that there can be multiple isomers of a particular compound present. And so uh, what we've been doing, I'll, I'll mention this and then I'll come back to the uh, certainty of communicating structures, is we've been collecting all the data that we've been generating under the first task and feeding that information uh, to NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. They are compiling a list of compounds and it's available on their GitHub site, uh, but they're also uh, working to develop an HRMS library uh, that can uh, help people uh, identify compounds, uh, PFASs specifically using HRMS. But one of the key things of this is that when you uh, identify something with HRMS, you often don't have an authentic standard. And so our ability to uh, correctly identify a compound uh, is, is certainly contingent on the data that is embedded in that HRMS data set. And so one of the, the challenges we're, we're trying to address is how you communicate the certainty of identifying a particular PFAS in a sample given HRMS data. And so there's a manuscript that we're working on with people actually from, from all over the globe trying to summarize how we think it would be best be to communicate that certainty uh, from HRMS data. So that's another work that will hopefully be out here uh, in the coming months. I mentioned uh, our collaboration with NIST. I, I really want to emphasize that eventually this will be the place to go uh, for uh, comparing your HRMS data, but also looking for uh, compounds that may be present if you want a, a suspect list of potential PFASs. Uh, H, um, uh, for HRMS analysis, NIST already has that available. Uh, and so we are working with them to expand their library with our or source characterization data uh, and also see how well different platforms. Uh, so we you have SIAC systems in our lab. We also have a thermo system. How well do these different uh, mass spec manufacturing data that are generated compare uh, when you're doing HRMS analysis uh, of PFASs from uh, environmental samples? So just to conclude, um, you know, we've done a, an extensive characterization of a sample archive as well as new samples that were collected uh, as part of this project. Seven major different types of sources uh, have been analyzed at this point. Um, early results, preliminary results suggest that there's some interesting non-mil uh, non spec signatures where you see these odd chain link perfluorocarboxylates that are, I think are pretty uh, interesting and uh, important. You know, we're working on documenting these degradation pathways uh, to try and look for uh, potential semi-stable compounds, particularly those that might fall out of our multivariate statistic analysis, suggesting that they might be differentiating. Uh, our multivariate tools, I think, are, are starting to show they're going to be very useful uh, for uh, addressing this question of what are the differentiating compounds for different types of uh, environmental samples. And then again, our, our collaboration with NIST to try and get these HRMS data out there so that folks who need to use that or want to use that uh, can, can use that uh, in a robust fashion. Mentioned some of these uh, benefits to DOD. We think our, our tools are already helping to differentiate uh, presence and, uh, and absence of HBLF and maybe even different types of HBLF. Uh, I, I, again, I think this non-mil spec HBLF uh, signature is, is pretty darn interesting. Uh, and then really trying to get the standardized open source platform independent tools working with NIST to facilitate uh, robust forensic analysis. So with that, uh, I think I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh, I should Great. mention. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, 
go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to say a thank you to the, the co-PIs uh, and all the, the, the hard uh, work of the students and postdocs who actually uh, did all the analysis. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Great. And we have a number of questions for you, but let's start with a very important one. Um, are you aware if commercial labs are currently offering or planning to offer high resolution mass spectrometry analysis um, or HRMS? Uh, my, the short answer is I think yes. Uh, I think that uh, there are a number of commercial labs that are starting down this path. I don't know exactly what uh, products they are necessarily offering. Uh, this is definitely something that for the moment would be off menu uh, at a commercial lab uh, or would be uh, a specific request. But it's my understanding that they are developing these sorts of capabilities to do these sorts of analyses. Uh, it may not be ready today, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if six months from now, some of these commercial labs were uh, including this as part of their standard offering. That's good to know. Thank you, Chris. I, I think the non milspac A triple F versus the milspac A triple F. It's, it's it's a new uh, category for a lot of our audience members. So we did receive a lot of questions on this. Can you elaborate on first uh, on why non milspac A triple F is relevant to the Department of Defense? Well, I think it's relevant in that uh, the whole point of this PFAS forensics effort is to identify whether or not, um, at least from my reading of, of the statement of need, uh, PFAS contamination at, um, at any particular location is attributed to military activities, in other words, activities on a military site or other types of sites. And to the extent that non-milspec HPLF use is a release of PFAS, it's, it's I think entirely legitimate to look at that. Uh, now, whether this happened on, uh, with fence line partners or not, I, I don't know. I don't have a specific site to indicate that that uh, has occurred uh, with immediately adjacent to a military site. But to the extent that uh, this is showing that there are other types of foam that may have been used that are showing different signatures than the foams that uh, were used by the military, I think is an important finding. Great. Thank you, Chris. Can we please go to slide 49? This is a question specific to this slide. Were you surprised to discover the differences in chemistries, specifically the even versus the odd carboxylic acids between previously analyzed milspec samples and the non-milspec sample results that you presented here? It, were we surprised to see this, I think was the question? Yes. I, I, I will say this was, was, was a bit of a surprise uh, in that we think that um, we have been, there's been so much focus on military specification foam appropriately uh, from our DOD funding uh, that we hadn't necessarily looked at these non-milspec, things that did not meet military specification as closely. And uh, I do think that this is showing that there, there may be cases where they, the same chemistry was used there may be cases where different chemistry was being used. And I think this is a great example. Uh, we, we, we just need to keep looking at all the data and see if this is more common or not, where different chemistries are present in the non-military specification foams. Great, thank you. Um, Chris, will the NIST PFAS library be freely available or available for purchase? in an updated NIST mass spectral library? This is, a mass, this is a question from New Mexico State University. So um, I think uh, the plan is, well, I can tell you what I know about, um, that's a great question for NIST to answer, to be honest, um, but my understanding is the list of compounds, the suspect list is, is freely available for download um, from their GitHub site. So you can go today uh, to their GitHub uh, PFAS. I think if you search uh, GitHub PFAS NIST, uh, it'll come up. And that is a list of uh, compounds for which people have observed them either in environmental samples or we expect that they might be present in environmental samples because of their presence in a homologous series. The uh, MS2 data, the mass spectral library that NIST is developing, I actually don't know uh, if they plan to uh, make it a, a pay uh, service or not. Um, but it is something that um, they are developing uh, and they're developing through the CERTA program. So 
Um, I, I, I certainly would hope that it would be open source and freely available to others, but I, I can't say that for certain. And, and you can go to the link that Andrea provided for whoever is asking that question and click on a project description or under the forensics, um, you can view the project description and reach out to the PI directly. But a follow on question uh, related to this library from EPA, Chris, and if you're unable to answer it, that's fine too. Do you know if the library is going to require the use of specific chromatographic conditions? Um, when performing spectral comparisons between lab data and the library, things like mobile phase solvents and buffers. Um, is this something you're involved with through your lab? So that's a great question. Um, you know, the mass spectral library is really focused on the mass spec part of uh, LC uh, mass spec. And so um, you could theoretically use it uh, in any sort of system where you have um, uh, you may use a different way of separating your 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 samples via LC. I do think that's likely going to be uh, certain recommendations in terms of different uh, separation of, of compounds, simply because if you don't uh, separate the compounds via your LC in, a, in an adequate manner, um, and, and including separation of isomers, um, you know, uh, then you may not get as clean a MS uh, spectral file, which may um, complicate uh, your comparison to the library. So I wouldn't be surprised if there are going to be some recommendations uh, with respect to uh, what sort of separation you're using. Um, but um, use, I would imagine you could still use the library even if you're not using the recommended separation. Great, thank you. This is a question from EPA Region 10. What PFAS uh, patterns are you seeing in landfill leachate samples? So that's we're still in the process of looking at it. Um, and I will say uh, everything that we, I think have seen so far has been generally consistent with the previous analysis of landfill leachate uh, out there. Uh, so there's a number of publications that Jennifer Field has, has published uh, previously. And I think a couple of other groups have also done landfill leachate. Uh, and uh, we can certainly, if you shoot me an email, we could um, direct you to those uh, specific publications. I think everything is fairly consistent with that, but what we're trying to do with this project is not so much just look at that those uh, profiles in isolation, but rather compare and contrast those profiles to these different uh, sources. And that's that's what we're undertaking right now. Thank you, Chris. We've received three questions on your power plant affluent uh, content. Can you, uh, for starters, elaborate on the nature of PFAS and power plant affluent? It's a great question. Uh, this is one of those where uh, I actually am in, uh, somewhat in the dark uh, in that um, for some of the different types of samples that we were uh, we collected, uh, we, we worked collaboratively to collect those and, uh, and we analyzed them. Uh, there were other samples that were made available to Jennifer Fields Lab uh, through various uh, routes of, uh, of contact. And uh, while we've talked about the, there being concerns about there being potential PFASs in those effluents, uh, I, I don't necessarily know what the suspicion is as to why they're present um, in those effluents. But for, for various reasons, uh, they have been suspected. Uh, and so uh, we, because we had the samples available, we, we said, what the heck, we're gonna include them in our analysis and see if we see a different signature uh, for these compounds in those samples. Great. Um, when you when you talked the, about the mil spec versus non mil spec A triple F, um, and tying your presentation to David, uh, the odd chain uh, carboxylic acids could be a result of uh, precursor transformation uh, rather than non mil spec A triple F. How conclusive are your results or um, in terms of distinguishing the odd chain uh, carboxylic acids between these two options. Is, is this uh, a conclusive method or the, the, the precursor transformation issue may confound interpretation of the result? So uh, my, my take on this is that, you know, we, we analyzed neat product uh, as best we could. Uh, in other words, 
some of these foams were straight out of unsealed containers. Now, this brought up the issue of why did we see that kind of outlier um, that was clustering with the with the the uh, ECF foam that uh, otherwise was from a non ECF manufacturing source. But to the extent that these compounds are stable enough in foams and there's not extensive precursor transformation, um, we do think this is indicative of and the concentrations you're seeing here are indicative of them likely being added as, as intentional products as opposed to uh, transformations or uh, transformation products of, of precursors. Um, but we certainly are looking in, in the environmental samples uh, and considering that uh, as a potential reason why you might see certain uh, carboxylates and sulfates uh, present because they're being transformed from these precursors. But in this particular slide, at least that we're looking at now, um, these are neat products. These were not environmental samples that were looked at. Great, thank you. At this point, Chris, I'd love to pull David back in and do a little bit of a back and forth between the remaining questions that we have for both of you. So back to David then for the first question. This is from the Oregon Department of Energy. Um, you mentioned that iron presents some challenges for the top assay. Is it just iron that uh, presents limitations or all metals and potentially uh, chromium or radionuclides uh, may also impact the results of the top assay. So we focused our attention on iron because it's prevalent at such high concentrations in, in crustal material. And so in groundwater, it gets reduced and you can have uh, many milligrams per liter. And so it precipitates out. If there were other metals present like chromium and it was present at you know tens of milligrams per liter I, I presume you could form a chromium oxide or hydroxide that could absorb PFAS but typically when we think about radionuclides or trace metals their precipitation won't lead to a high surface area or a high mass of uh, minerals that could absorb the PFAS so I guess after iron, I would be most concerned about perhaps manganese and manganese oxides, or if you had a sample with lots of, I don't know, clay colloids or something like that. But, but really, iron is the one that I think is the greatest concern because it'll come into a sample at high concentrations. Uh, and then when you, you oxidize it, you'll be producing those oxides in situ. And there are opportunities for co-precipitation or surface absorption. Thank you, David. And now to you, Chris. On slide 52, you talked about the transfer, transformation pathway mapping. Um, are the pathways displayed expected in the environment? And would they be the same based on the top assay? So I'll take that in two parts. Uh, the first is many of these studies are, are laboratory-based studies, so where people have um, uh, taken uh, samples of these materials uh, or neat materials and incubated them in, in the environment, or sorry, in a, in a microcosm uh, or mesocosm in the, in the laboratory, but often using uh, cultures or soils uh, from the environment. So to the extent that laboratory work is not always representative of what happens out in the real world, um, that is an open question. Um, uh, one of the things that we do discuss in the manuscript that we're working on here uh, and my hat's off to Yung Dong Choi, the, the lead author on that work, is, is try to look at this in the context of what has actually been observed uh, at these different sites. So unfortunately, uh, not many uh, uh, research groups or uh, publications are out there showing the levels of these different intermediates uh, at uh, different sites, so it is fairly limited. Um, but everything we've seen so far is, is pretty consistent that some of these pathways may be active um, out in environmental samples. So um, I think that's uh, important, but it's an open question for sure as to how representative laboratory experiments are of transformations happening uh, out in the environment. But all the data so far uh, is suggestive that it's, it's pretty good. Um, the second question related to uh, the hydroxyl radical transformation in the top assay, this is important to keep in mind. There's a big difference between the transformations that happen in an abiotic hydroxyl radical oxidation pathway versus what you might see that is microbially driven. Uh, and so uh, in this sort of example, uh, 
uh, David can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure all of these compounds would generate uh, something like PFOA uh, in the top assay. Uh, and, and here biologically, we end up with PFOS being the terminal product. So I do think that's an important distinction between uh, hydroxyl radical transformation and that which you see uh, in uh, microbial transformation settings. Although, let me add here, Chris, um, some of the work that's come out of our laboratories, for example, the work that Shan Yi did or that uh, Katie Margenovic, Harding Margenovic did on, on the uh, fluorotelomer thioether metosulfonates, uh, we saw carboxylate production. So we have seen uh, cases where there, there are uh, AFFF components, mainly the, the or telomeres that produce carboxylates during biotransformation. Completely agree. I, I guess I was looking at this this slide, which was the ECF chemistries, but but yeah, I, I right. would agree that that would be the case. Thank you both. And I have a question for both of you. Um, and, and we'll start off being a bit specific. Do you see the multivariate analysis combined with the top assay? result as a means um, for differentiating between a potential PFAS source and regional background concentrations. So if you can start, David, and then I'd like Chris to weigh in about a potential uh, way to combine tools to differentiate not just between AFFF and non-AFFF sources, but be be you know between um, specific sources and background concentrations in general. David? Uh, it's an intriguing question, Rula. I, I think it, it's, it's to be seen yet what the, the regional back, my, my expectation is that the regional background signal may end up looking uh, somewhat like wastewater effluent because there's a lot of effluent dominated rivers. Um, there, there might be an atmospheric signal, but that might not be detectable. So I think as you go from source zones where you have a specific fingerprint and you start mixing with a, a regional background, uh, you, you may uh, start to see uh, some, some ability to pick those out. And, and it may be that the top assay doesn't give you enough information, and then you have to actually supplement it with the kinds of more specific measurements that Chris told us about today. Um, and then the only question there is, at some point as you're going from a source zone down to regional background, your ability to detect some of these less prevalent compounds may disappear. And, and that, that could be a, a, a limitation of all of these techniques is that as, as you get to uh, lower, more and more dilute samples, you mainly have things like PFOS and the more prevalent uh, carboxylate terminal transformation products. Thank you, David. Chris, uh, do you have any um, opinions to, to share with the group, please? Well, I would just say that I do think um, the tools that David discussed, as, as well as the, the various tools that we discussed, are extremely com complementary. Um, and I think that we should expect um, needing to use potentially multiple tools uh, when you're trying to differentiate um, a stormwater impact versus a wastewater versus an HFLF release. Um, the question of regional background um, is an interesting one in that um, I do think my, my initial inclination, not having looked as closely at, um, at characterizing rain samples and the, and the, and the like, is that um, when you start to look at those sorts of um, sources, you tend to, they tend to be fairly weathered, if, if I can use that term, which means they are fairly down that, uh, that funnel where you, you might see not only low levels, but also uh, really just the carboxylates and sulfonates. This is essentially what, what David was saying. And that may be more tricky to differentiate uh, in, in some of these different sources. Um, but, you know, we can only try and, and see how well they work in those sorts of uh, situations. Great, thank you both. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So I will encourage our audience members with any remaining questions to uh, reach out to David and Chris directly. And David and Chris, thank you for a very intriguing set of presentations here.
in wrapping up, I'd like to remind everybody that our next webinar in the series is in the environmental restoration area on January 13, 2022. The focus will be on DOD funded research to advance co-metabolic remediation of both traditional and emerging uh, contaminants in soil and groundwater. The speaker will be Dr. Paul Hatzinger from Aptum Federal Services and registration is open. So please visit the Startup ESCCP webinar webpage to register for this and other webinars through the end of 2022. And if you look at the 2022 list, for those of you that are interested in PFAS, you'll see that a lot of the, um, at least one third of the uh, webinars uh, is on PFAS. And before we conclude, um, just remember that both the audio and a copy of the presentation of today's session will be archived on the webinar webpage in case you'd like to refer to them in the future. We would appreciate it at this time if you can take a quick moment to uh, complete a survey that will pop up on your screen. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you so much for your participation.